Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum and we have a really cool rifle to take a look at today. This is a Swedish prototype self-loading rifle using the Freiburg patent, which was the beginning of flapper locking. This would go on to be used in the German uh, G43 rifles, the G41 Walther rifles, the MG42 machine guns, the Degkurev uh, whole pattern, whole system. Uh, Degkurev was largely based on this patent. Uh, and it's really cool to get a chance to take a look at one of the very early progenitors of that whole system. Now, what makes this a really a, an additionally interesting patent is that this uh, Swedish gentleman by the name of Freiburg uh, developed this in the 1870s as a mechanism for a self-loading rifle. The problem was in the 1870s, of course, you were using black powder, and black powder fouling is a death knell for semi-auto rifles. So. Freiburg was never able to actually get a gun running in that time period. They had to wait about 20 years until this thing took form because they needed smokeless powder to make a self-loading rifle viable. Now, this was manufactured by a company called Stockholm's Vapenfabrik, which was an in the further the, the incarnation of the Nordenfelt Gun Company. It's the same Nordenfelt factory, just under a different name. Uh, Nordenfelt had been a Swedish, was a Swedish guy. Uh, who had developed a manual, sort of a manual machine gun, a multi-barrel repeating firearm. The Nordenfelt was one of the major uh, pre-machine guns used by military powers around the world. Uh, it competed directly with the Gatling and the Gardner guns primarily, and then some other smaller companies as well. But uh, Nordenfelt, originally uh, they made artillery, they made these Nordenfelt guns. Uh, they actually made a U-boat in the 1880s, you know, a submarine. And they ended up partnering with the Maxim company, became the Maxim Nordenfelt company. That didn't last very long. Um, was reorganized as Stockholm Vapenfabrik. And at that point, in at some point in the late 1890s to the very first few years of the 1900s, they manufactured this. So at the time, uh, the superintendent or the chief engineer of the factory was a guy named Yelman. Uh, it's K-J-E-L-L-M-A-N. And so these are often uh, known as Yelman pattern guns. Um, I think the, the formal official name would be a uh, Freiburg Yelman, uh, giving credit to both the guy who made them and the guy who patented the idea. At any rate, uh, they made a, either 51 or 53 of these rifles in a huge variety of configurations. This wasn't a government arsenal. They were attempting to, well, they were making the rifle to sell commercially and they wanted to get contracts with military powers. So. They made these guns in all sorts of different calibers. Um, the obvious ones to start with were some of the Scandinavian calibers, so they made them in 6.5, um, and then they also made them in European, you know, Southern European calibers, 303 British there were plans for. Interestingly, this particular one is in uh, the 8x57S cartridge, that specific barrel and chamber um, size setup. That was what the German military adopted in 1905. Now, that could mean this gun wasn't made until 1905, although I think it's earlier. Um, it seems like more like an 1899-1900 pattern of gun. Uh, it could be that that chamber and barrel specification was available before the German military adopted it, and the factory decided to try and get ahead of the curve. It's also possible that the gun was rebarreled at some point. Um, in an effort to get German military testing or adoption. Uh, I don't know exactly what led to the... I don't know exactly the circumstances surrounding the chambering on this particular one, but um, like I said, there are a wide variety of them out there, and they differ hugely uh, in form, really. Uh, some of them actually have fully covered receivers. Some of them, like this one, have an open bolt and receiver. It's just, uh, you know, they were trying to get contracts and making things they thought would appeal to different groups. Ultimately, they were not able to get any military contracts, and the 50-some rifles of uh, prototypes like this are all that actually survive. So uh, we are going to take this apart, and then we are actually going to take it out on the range and see if we can get it to fire. I don't know that this has fired in probably close to 100 years. Hi there, puppy and she is very excited to get it to shoot. So let's start by taking it apart, and then we'll head out to the range. So there's only one substantial marking on this, and that is right here on top of the receiver, Stockholm's Vapenfabrik, 
uh, and the serial number, 33, that number is going to be repeated on a whole bunch of the other parts. There's another example right there. Now, in terms of configuration, this is absolutely set up as a military rifle. In fact, especially from looking at the Langevazir style, the, the German style of rear sight here, you would think this is a military rifle. Well, it's not, not entirely. This was a military trials rifle. Um, Stockholm's Wappenfabrik was not an actual government arsenal. They did a lot of military work, of course, but they were trying to get this rifle adopted by militaries, and so they built them in a military pattern. Military sights, military style handguard. At the front end here we have a bayonet lug, cleaning rod. This is all very much a military pattern rifle, not a sporting pattern rifle. And one of the more unique features is this on the back. This acts as a physical safety to guarantee that the bolt doesn't come back and actually hit the shooter, and it also actually blocks the trigger. Lift that up. It takes quite a lot of force to open the bolt uh, manually. And then you can see there is a there are two little cutouts for a stripper clip right there. The magazine holds five rounds and it does lock open when empty. Uh, so interestingly, there is this secondary spring on the follower, and there's a reason for that. You'll see why a little bit later when we take this apart. But what happens is the gun is going to accelerate the bolt open, and then after it's opened, when the whole recoil system starts to go forward, it's going to accelerate the bolt forward. And so that spring is there on the follower to decelerate the bolt when you have already when you fired the last round. Otherwise, it would accelerate the bolt and slam it into the follower and eventually damage it. So that spring there is just a decelerator. And this has a very small ejection port, just big enough to load cartridges in and to kick spent cases out. So um, I think had this actually gone into military service, they probably would have wanted to open that up a fair amount uh, just to make it a little more reliable. The two round cutouts here, of course, are for your thumb for loading a stripper clip. One other interesting feature here, and this is something that you see on a number of early semi-auto rifles, this is a basically a manual operation disconnect. So in the downward position like this, the rifle functions as a semi-auto, but I can rotate it up just slightly, uh, locks into position there, and this disables the gas system, it or disables the recoil system, locks the, the action in place, and allows you to use the gun as a manual straight pull uh, bolt action. There we go. I can push this in, take out the follower. It's got a pair of leaf springs. You know, this whole thing is just very intricately machined. You can see how that all interacts in there. The, the X-shaped springs for magazine follower. And of course, another number 33. Uh, these did have a variety of different configurations as they were trying to market them to different countries. And so there are some that have, there's one that has a tubular magazine under the, under the stock or under the barrel. There's one that has an extended magazine that comes down probably 10 rounds. This one has a pretty standard military pattern, uh, five round magazine. We have a bolt release right here. That's this kind of serrated pad. So pull the bolt back, pull this in. This forces the locking lugs to retract in and allows us to remove this. Now the remainder of disassembly is a little bit trickier. Um, basically the, the front half and the back half of the rifle come apart and they're locked in place by the magazine well. So not just the follower uh, here, but the magazine well box actually comes out. So for disassembly, it starts with this cross button here. You push that in, you can see it coming out the other side. That allows you to just slightly separate the upper and, or the front and back pieces. Then you can remove the magazine box. This is a process that's a little tricky and it takes a little bit of help from the rifle's owner. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that off camera and we will be right back with the gun disassembled. The core concept here is that there are a pair of locking lugs at the front of the bolt, which can retract into the bolt when it's cycling, and it protrude out from the bolt in order to lock it in position when it's actually firing. 
Now, as a safety mechanism and, well, part of the operating system, we have a firing pin here running all the length of the bolt. And you can see at the front, it's got this large square, square-ish sort of protrusion. What that does is force the locking lugs out into the locked position like this when the gun fires. So if the firing pin is protruding out the front of the bolt, this is forcing the locking lugs outward. That means that there's no way that the gun can fire when it's out of battery. And that's, of course, the primary safety consideration for guns in general. So that's, that's how that is taken care of. Um, this system was originally, as I said earlier, patented in the 1870s, but not fully refined until smokeless powder became available. And, uh, and this is the first gun that actually made use of this system. Now it would go on to be used in a bunch of other guns, uh, fairly, fairly successful ones actually. Um, Degturev used a, a conceptually similar system, or conceptually identical system really, uh, in the DP and the RPD and the DSHK machine guns. And then the Germans would actually use this in a number of guns. This is very similar to the G43 um, and the Walther G41. And it's also pretty similar to the MG42 operating system. Uh, the MG42 used rollers instead of square locking lugs, uh, but working in very much the same manner. So a really cool and early fundamental concept here from Yelman and manufactured by the Swedes. Now, uh, let's put this in the receiver. I've got a bolt release here that comes forward and slide that in there. Now I have the bolt in the receiver and we can see some interesting stuff by looking at the bottom. So down here you can really kind of see what's going to happen. There is no spring on this bolt. Uh, it is physically controlled by this arm, sorry, this arm right here, which we'll touch on in a moment. But first let me show you when I lock this in place. Is that that's all the way in place. And you can see right down there, one of the locking lugs, the top one's a little harder to see, but you can see that the locking lug has been pushed out into the side of the receiver where it's locked. The trailing ends of the, the locking flaps are back here. And then the, the firing pin is ready to fire. When it does, it will go forward. In fact, I can probably, there we go. Now, firing pin has fired, so it's gone forward, and the center lug of the firing pin is now forcing those two lugs uh, outwards. Not that they were going to come back anyway, really, but that's just a, a redundant precaution there. Uh, the gun fires, and now, in order to cycle, uh, the bolt's going to be thrown backward, which I said we'll get to in a moment, but you can see that this cocking piece is now all the way forward. Now it's recocked. Now the firing pin's back. So there it is, fired. And there's the firing pin coming back and recocked. Now, the operating mechanism of the gun is a little bit, well, is also quite unusual, and the operating mechanism is one that did not see a lot of later service. This is a short recoil gun. And up under the handguard here, we have this very impressively strong recoil spring wrapped around the barrel. So this piece, this whole assembly is gonna move backwards. However, this arm is blocked. It is resting against this shelf right here in the lower receiver. So if I line these up like so, you can see that's exactly where everything is resting. This isn't going to move because this is firmly planted in the shooters shoulder by way of the buttstock. So what will happen instead is this piece has to pivot. And when it pivots, it's going to get here, catch the bolt, and throw the bolt back. And I can't really show you that because the amount of force involved makes it a little difficult to do by hand. So this camming arm is going to control, it's going to hold on to the bolt, it's going to cam it backwards to this point, or rather it's going to kick it open at the beginning and then it maintains control of the bolt. So when the bolt comes to the end of its travel, you can see that's they're connected right there. At the end of its travel right there, this arm catches the bolt and stops it from going any farther back. So 
because of that, uh, there is really no need for a recoil spring on the bolt. This is going to get kicked back forward into battery when this whole assembly goes forward, again, because of this spring. Once it's reached this position, then uh, it has run out of energy to move backwards, it's going to start going forward, and this is going to then throw the bolt forward like that, and it will have enough energy when that happens to Man, it is, the locking lugs make it sticky up front, but um, at this point, let's see, there it is, right there, uh, when the whole thing goes forward, that kicks the bolt forward, charges, uh, well, chambers a new round from the magazine, and locks in place ready to fire again. This is a really counterintuitive system because of the lack of a spring in the bolt. Uh, it just is very foreign, very alien to the way that uh, we're used to self-loading rifles today. All right, it's time to actually give this thing a try at the range. So, we have some very old DWM ammo. I think it's a five round magazine. Two. Three. Four. There is a stripper clip guide here, but we don't have any clips handy. Five. Yeah, it's a five round magazine. And again, you have this very unorthodox feeling, just loose bolt without spring tension because of that hook inside that actually operates it. So, now we're ready to fire. I have the safety, the safety and face guard up. Let's give it a try. Failure to eject. Actually, a really pleasant gun to shoot. The recoil from it is nice and soft, um, not harsh at all. Kind of, I mean, actually, it's a little less than I was expecting from this is a full power eight millimeter Mauser rifle. Usually, with a self loading mechanism, you'll get some of that absorbed by the system, but uh, I want to try that standing up because I think it'll be even nicer and fairly controllable. And now that I'm fairly certain that it's not going to throw the bolt back through the center of my face. Let's try a few more rounds. One. Two. Three. Four. This would be easier with a stripper clip. And five. There we go. All right. and one feed malfunction on the last round, which is kind of a common thing for older guns like this. Let's do some more. All right, we've loaded one last magazine up. There we go. This is still really, really weird feeling to operate because there's no recoil spring and you just kind of slide it into place and hope that the little face guard works. Not sure if it fed. It did. Ooh. All right. There we go. 
So what's interesting there that happened was I had a failure to fully eject the cartridge and the cartridge case came up in this little slot where you feed and the, the recoil system was actually still partially back uh, and it had been jammed in place by the cartridge. So when I pushed the cartridge down in, that freed up the barrel assembly to, to finish going forward. And then I was able to use the bolt to cycle the empty case out. That is a very, gives you a very weird feeling operating this. I think I've said that probably too many times now, but it's really true. The number of things on this gun that are just totally counterintuitive to the way that we would expect a firearm to work today is substantial, but extremely cool to get a chance to actually shoot one of these very early prototype uh, flapper locked Swedish semi-auto rifles. So, well, a big thank you to the owner of this rifle who let us come out here and actually try running ammunition through it today. It was kind of a little bit of a question if it was going to work or perhaps just explode. But it worked remarkably nicely for a prototype that's 118 years old now. So hopefully you guys enjoyed the video. Hopefully you learned about a cool new gun today. If you enjoy seeing this sort of thing, please do consider checking out my Patreon page. It's support from folks like you at a buck a month that makes it possible for me to travel to places like beautiful overcast Sweden today to bring you guys guns like this one. Thanks for watching.